Hey, it's Lemon. Welcome to the... Alright, look, you saw the thumbnail, you read the title, you know exactly what's about to happen here. We're about to dive into the absolute worst possible pyromancy in the longest game of the Dark Souls trilogy. If ever there was a time to walk away, this is it. No? Still here? Alright, just remember, you chose this. So, Dark Souls 2, everyone's favorite. Good to be back. This run has been plaguing my mind ever since I started it last year. And apparently, I wasn't the only one. Our lord and savior Yamfa, hallowed be thy flame, decided to unscratch the immolation run from his little black book and take it to task. And for those of you who haven't watched it yet, too bad, I'm spoiling it. The madman did it. He actually beat Dark Souls 2 with immolation only. However, in true Yamfa style, the man went out of his way to completely break the game to accomplish his goal. Flying this way and that, party walking his way to the end of the game, where he burned Nishandra to a pile of cinders which proved two things. First, he proved that, technically, one can access the Immolation Pyromancy without killing any bosses, if you're Yamfa, or a glitching god. And second, that the game can, in fact, be beaten with Immolation, if you skip 95% of it. And it's at this point, this point right here, where I should have nodded in approval and moved on with my life. But I didn't, because God has cursed me for my hubris, and my work is never finished. So, while I get a few odds and ends from around Majula, let's talk about Emily. Ah! Ah! Goodness, what a terrible accident. If only you knew someone who focused on personal injury law. Ah! Oh, alright. I suppose I can tell you about Morgan & Morgan. Morgan & Morgan is America's largest injury law firm. They have over 100 offices all across the states, and more than 800 lawyers and 4,000 case staff at the ready. No worrying about if your case is too big to handle, they've got the staff to handle it and can find the lawyer with the right experience and expertise to handle your case. What's more, Morgan & Morgan has taken the stance that they only require payment if they win. No upfront costs, no sign-up fees. Any research, paperwork, court fees, professional witnesses, all of it is free unless you win. And remember, if you are injured and thinking about suing, you're not suing an individual. You're suing an insurance company whose entire reason for existence is to account for things like this. So, if you're ever injured in an accident, you can check out Morgan & Morgan. For more information, go to ForThePeople.com slash XXX, or dial pound LAW from your phone. <laughs> you know, when you're free. So, while I get a few odds and ends from around Majula, let's talk about Immolation. Don't worry, there's not a whole lot to say. Immolation is exactly what it says on the tin. You light yourself on fire, then do damage to both yourself and those around you. Terrible, painful, slow, and unupgradable damage. And I mean that literally. There is zero things you can do to increase the damage. You can't upgrade your pyro glove, items that boost damage do absolutely nothing, and armor pieces that would normally give a boost to pyromancies just don't. They, they, they just don't. So you've only one option. Get as much health and cast of immolation as you can. But there's a problem there too. Immolation can only be found in the Iron Keep, and it's inside a metal chest. And while those of you less familiar with Dark Souls 2 are probably screaming, Just use a bonfire aesthetic! No! Bad! Doesn't work! Because metal chests do not respawn with bonfire aesthetics. Only wooden ones. Thank you, Dark Souls. Are you starting to get the picture? Are you starting to see why even Yamfa waited until he had a glitch to let him skip the entire game? But this is the backlogs. And in case you're new here, we don't skip bosses unless they're impossible. Which means my suffering has only just begun. We've only just begun... So, let's discuss what the plan is. First things first, I joined the company of champions, made a bunch of hide knights throw themselves into the water as an offering to my withered soul, then leveled up my vitality until I could fall into the Majula pit. Yes, I could have just got the cat ring, but we're gonna need all the health we can get on this run, so we might as well start now. I then realized that I would need even more vitality to get to the very bottom, and decided to get the cat ring anyway. I... Th th this run hurt me, okay? It it's just gonna be like that sometimes. After ineffectively sneaking past the Splody Boys, I made my way down into Blighttown, uh, I mean the gutter, where I sprinted past every miserable creature that lives down there, and eventually stumbled upon the item of my desires, the Dark Pyromancy Flame. One piece down, one to go. Now we could proceed to follow the footsteps of Yamfa, glitching my way through the game to unlock the pyromancy of my choice, or we could just pray to the Firebomb Goddess for assistance. I'm not sure if I should be thankful or upset right now. And with Immolation in hand, we can now begin the run proper. As you can see, Immolation slowly and consistently decreases my health over a period of 30 seconds. Casting it multiple times does not increase the damage or self-damage. 
and only serves to reset the timer. And that's really all you need to know. You can technically avoid some of the self damage if you roll at the exact right time due to iframes, but trust me when I say, it's not worth the effort. All right, let's get this journey to hell started. But first, a demonstration. As you can see, the casting time of immolation is pretty awful, and the damage is even worse. Granted, these boys walked through the river to get here, so they have extra fire resistance at the moment, but still. So yeah, we'll be sprinting past literally every enemy we can. Ow. There's a few items around the map that'll make our travel times a little easier, like the Chloranthi Ring, Life Ring, the Way of Blue Ring, things like that. But none of that really helps us when we get stuck in a corner, which happens pretty often. But such is the hand we've been dealt. I grab a semi-decent shield to hide behind, then make my way to the first boss of the run, the Last Giant. All right, let's get this party started. So if you're wondering what the Immolation Run's gameplay would look like, uh, yeah, pretty much this. So, uh, how's life going for you? Two casts in, and the Giant is at about 60% health. Better than I was expecting, if I'm being honest. But we're officially out of Estus, so we need to start implementing the one and only thing that's gonna keep this run alive. Life Gems. Life Gems heal you at a rate of 500 health over 10 seconds. Immolation damages you at a rate of 1300 health over 30 seconds. Some very quick napkin math shows that a single Life Gem will, in fact, mitigate the damage of Immolation. For 10 seconds, anyway. But if you pop multiple, the healing effects stack, which means rather than lingering at the same health, you can slowly regenerate your health during the spell as well. So, with our endgame strategy already in place, the last giant goes down after five casts. Not too terrible, all things considered. Granted, we're gonna need far more casts of immolation if we're gonna go up against the later bosses, but I've got an idea- Oh, hello, who's this? Well, at least he helps showcase one of the few positives about immolation. It goes through shields, so that's good, I guess. So, now that we know the build works, it's time to make sure we can keep doing it for the rest of the run. I buy as many life gems as I can, which isn't much in the grand scheme of things, and steal Malencia's wedding ring so that I can hopefully afford more life gems in the future. Then it's just a matter of breaking into the Majula Mansion to get another Estus Flash Shard, followed by picking up the Ring of Restoration to hopefully help slow the constant burning sensation I have in my fingertips. 2 HP a second. Not exactly game breaking. But with our build insignificantly stronger, it's time for boss number two, the Pursuer. All right, Lemon, remember, Immolation takes time to cast, so choose the right moment. There's not much to say about this fight. It essentially plays out like any other Pursuer fight, just with less damage and more spinning. The Pursuer has plenty of slower animations, so finding time to recast Immolation isn't an issue. And so long as you've got two life gems popped at most times, this battle of attrition is almost guaranteed to go in your favor. Five casts later, and the Pursuer goes down. Simple enough. Not only that, but with him cleared, we now have access to our first 100% block shield. It's a tad heavy, but if it means we can tank through hits and stick close to enemies to maximize our damage output, I'm not complaining. Back to Hyde's Tower of Flame. Oh, how I missed you. Dragon Rider's up first. With our new shield in play, we can tank through every one of his hits, which means our damage is nice and consistent. And he's not exactly the most agile of knights, so getting a cast off is relatively doable. In the end, he's nothing more than a roadblock. Moving right along. A little sublime bone dust to spice up our mead, and before you know it, we're in Pirate Town. And right into the claws of the Flexile Sentry. This boss is a bit tough for two reasons, and they both stem from the same thing, the water. The water constantly rises, which means my ability to maneuver is going to get worse and worse as the fight goes on. And on top of that, the Flexile Sentry is getting a constant resistance to fire damage. Not enough to matter in the long run, but still enough to consider. But six casts later, he goes down all the same. Oh look, trash. Right, on to the next boss, the Ruined Sentinels. This is gonna be a bad time. Fighting them one-on-one -on -one isn't difficult, so there's no worries there. But a quick glance at the health bar should get that anxiety back up. Yep. It takes three casts of Immolation to kill one Sentinel, which means we need a grand total of nine casts. That's more casts than we have, which means we have two options. Pray to whomever will listen that the Sentinels crowd around you so that one cast does damage to multiple Sentinels, or spend multiple hours grinding so that you can get your attunement to 26. For those of you who haven't dabbled with sorcery in Dark Souls 2, leveling attunement does several things. It increases how many spell slots you have, which doesn't help me, increases your agility, and, more importantly, increases how many casts of each spell you get. Which means we now have nine casts of Immolation instead of eight, giving us just a little more wiggle room to work with. Not much, though. The Sentinels love to get pushy in phase two, which means less time spent hugging the Sentinels, and therefore less damage overall. And less damage means that despite having the proper number of casts, we're still not gonna be able to do this unless everyone agrees to a group hug. Hours wasted. 
Good job, gang. That's the kind of efficiency I like to see. I made a few desperate attempts at convincing the Sentinels that group hugs were the best hugs, but I don't think they're buying it. So I did the next best thing. I grinded for even longer, got my emulation cast up to 11, forced them all into a limited space, then gave them a group hug anyway. It's a little difficult being so cramped up here, what with the Sentinels constantly falling off and jump attacking their way back up, but the cramped space is definitely working in my favor. And with 9 casts and about 40 life gems used, the Rune Sentinels go down. Yes, I didn't need to grind to 11 casts after all. Excuse me for a moment while I scream into a pillow. Right, that last boss with multiple enemies was so much fun, what if we increased the number of enemies even more? Huh, turns out more enemies does not, in fact, equal more fun. Would've thought. Yeah, this ain't happening. We're gonna need several upgrades to this build before we can even consider this one. Let's move on. No, oh, shut up over there, you'll get your turn. Time for the Lost Sinner. The Bed of Chaos Reborn. Allegedly. I don't know, man, the lore is weird. Turns out there must be some level of validity to it, though, because the Sinner is pretty fire resistant, all things considered. But, be that as it may, she has some heavy wind-up attack animations, so getting off casts isn't too bad. And the damage, though smaller, is still going to be enough to finish the fight. And seven casts later, the Lost Sinner goes down. One Lord Soul down, three to go. I also freed Strayed from his petrification, not because I enjoy his company, but because he has the lingering Dragon Crest Ring. This increases all spell effects by 15%, which means that the damage over time of immolation is increased by 15%. Granted, that's on both ends, enemies and myself, but hey, more time means less casts. I also decided to splurge a bit and get some new armor, because if we're going to burn to death over and over again, we might as well do it in style. Anyway, We've already run through most of the gutter and black gulch getting our pyromancy glove, so what say we skip on down to the rotten, yeah? Huh, okay, that damage isn't as bad as I was expecting. I can work with that. As any speedrunner knows, the rotten is a great fight to grind on. He's slow, can't run away from your attacks, and drops a lot of souls on death. Super easy all the way around. Usually. Turns out, wearing less and rolling more is the way to go. Eye framing through all of his attacks at this point is a joke and staying as mobile as possible makes it infinitely harder for him to keep up with you. Just keep up the pressure and the flames, and before you know it, the Rotten will go down with five casts and minimal stress. Another Lord Soul down. Life is good. In fact, I'm feeling so good, I'm willing to try another multiple enemy boss fight. Hello? Hello? Ah, oh, there you are. Not much to say about the Rat Vanguard. They love to group around you, which means any concerns about having enough casts are completely out the window at this point. There is just one tiny little issue, though. It can petrify you, and it goes through shields. But just throw on your best petrification-resistant armor and shield, and take a breather by running to the opposite sides of the room every now and again, and you'll be fine. And once Rocky the Rat finally decides to make an appearance, it's a simple matter of stage diving into the pile of rats and getting in what damage you can. Just be sure to avoid getting greedy. That petrification meter can build up pretty quick if you're surrounded, so take your time and live to fight another day. Right. Easy boss, who's next? With a few more levels pumped into attunement and my immolation cast now up to 12, it's time to move on to the next area. My little pony, undead and bony, punish the world for their sins. The first order of business is taking down the necromancers. Just let the shield do most of the work and let my little bony take care of the boys outside. After that, we prove that undead horses can in fact break steel beams and also that undead horses have really terrible death perception giving a bad reputation to four eyes everywhere. It's slow going, and you have to be careful not to get pinned up against a wall while you stroll around the sides, but six casts later, and the executioner's chariot goes down. Which means it's time to visit the other half of the coin, the skeleton lords. The lords themselves are pretty resistant to fire, which, considering they're casting pyromancies, is to be expected, but they're only phase one, as each one summons a veritable army of undead when they die. In my infinite wisdom, I decided it would be a good idea to kill several lords at once, that way I could get the most bang for my buck with each immolation cast. May have overestimated myself on that one. But, despite there being way more Tony on the screen than I would like, this strategy did in fact save me several casts. Not sure if it was worth it, but hey, too late now. And with the last Skeleton Lord defeated, we just have the bone wit. Uh, what, uh, what's going on over there? You know what? It's not my place to ask. Seven casts of immolation. On to the next area. Into Harvest Valley we go where, mind you, we can find desert sorceresses. Sorcerai? These ladies have a small chance to drop the lingering dragon crest ring plus one, which would increase our spell length to 25% instead of 15%. Definitely important, but I've done enough grinding to last a lifetime. We'll come back for it if we need it, 
but not before. And so, with that mental note made, it's time to fight the covetous demon. What happened to you, man? You used to be terrifying back when I fought you in Pikmin 1. It's like you're not even trying anymore these days. Shameful. Five casts. What a waste. Another easy boss to grind, though. By the way, you should be writing down all the easy bosses. It'll be on the test later. Burn down the mill, fail to negotiate terms of passage with the locals, and after a long drop to our death, we're at Mytha, the Baneful Queen. Nothing too special to say about her. With her poison pool removed, there's little chance that she'll heal herself. And with our shield blocking all of her physical damage, there's no real reason not to be up close and huggable. Okay, uh, maybe not that huggable. Outside of that, Mytha's another exceptionally easy fight. I even knocked off her tail on accident. Six casts, first try. Move right along. Can I just say how weird it is to be first trying most of these bosses? I mean, yeah, none of them are all that hard, but you'd think that a build that can't do anything except sidestep around bosses would struggle at least a little bit. As it stands, my biggest problem with the run has been the trash mobs between me and the bosses, either due to high defenses, high density, or a combination of the two. Go on then, Sharon, get in the lava. Don't make me ask twice. Up next would normally be the Smelter Demon, but I don't need a wiki to tell me that 12 casts of immolation aren't gonna be enough. That behemoth is essentially fireproof. We're gonna need a few more bits and pieces before we can attempt to beat it. No, I'd much rather push forward. Push forward. Push forward. God damn it, got my way. You know what? I don't wanna be here anymore. So instead, let's go clean up a mess we left behind. Hey Ornstein, how's your goth phase coming along? Needless to say, the old Dragon Slayer is a complete pushover at this point. The only reason I waited this long was because of how annoying the dragon and his Hyde Knight friends were outside the arena. It takes four casts of immolation, but hey guys, do you remember Ornstein? Goes down with minimal effort. Much more importantly, look what I found in Ornstein's room. A 100% shield with more poise. I have to two-hand it to make it work, so that's a bit of a bummer. But I think the results speak for themselves. Besides, it's not like I need my hands to do damage anyway. Just to occasionally restart it. Anywho, let's go see who's behind the next door. Hmm, uh, you know? I think we might have hit a slight problem here. My man is wading through lava like it's lukewarm kiddie pool. Not exactly sure what immolation is gonna do to him. Oh no. Oh no! Well, call me crazy, but I don't think 12 immolations is gonna cut it. We may have to rethink our strategy a bit on this one. So with that in mind, it's time to go down the last path available to us. A few upgrades to the build, like a new Clorinthy ring and a clear bluestone ring plus one, which increases our casting speed. And before you know it, we're at Quelag's third cousin. Nachka. She's not exactly receptive. You love to see it. As far as damage goes, I'm not overly concerned. But I will say that her magic attacks are a bit rough. Dodging is definitely required. It takes far longer than I'd like, but after seven casts of immolation and a lot of sand dancing, Nachka returns to the sand from which she came. Which means it's onto the doors of Pharos, and therefore the Royal Rat Authority. The chitlins aren't too bad, so long as you keep an eye on your gauges and come in with proper shields and armor. Which I did not. But once you wade your way through all the burnt baby dog rat corpses, it's just a matter of playing keep away with mama. It's slow going, but what else is new? I will say, one positive takeaway from this build is that it does let you see every single attack an enemy has. I've never seen more than 5 seconds of this boss's second phase, but it's taking me about 12 times that to get through it with this build. Anyway, 7 casts of immolation, and the boss's authority is debunked. Time to go to the Spider-Verse. But before we could do that, we have to make it past the Prowling Magus and his congregation. And you know what? I'm gonna have to eat my words. And boy do they taste terrible. Who dies to the Prowling Magus? Me. I die to the Magus. Repeatedly. And if ever there was a way to explain to other players how bad this build is, this is it. This is the footage you can point to and say, See that? This is why we don't do that. Like most multiple enemy bosses, it's hard to compensate for the fact that you're getting hit from all sides. But unlike other multiple enemy bosses, this one sucks more because of all the casters. If you aren't careful, you'll get locked into a corner and beat down until you die by your own hand. And while the unique burning animation is fun to watch, the fact that I've died to the Prowling Magus more than I've died to every other boss before this point kinda spoils it for me. Most people don't consider this a boss, how the hell have I been stuck here for several hours? The strategy is simple enough. First, get rid of the adds that are constantly trying to beat you to death. Less fists flying at your shield means less problems you have to think about. Next, get rid of the casters, preferably the clerics, because they can heal Magoo if he starts to get low. And themselves, apparently. Cool, no, that's fine, that's fine. That's completely <laughs> So, now we just have to answer the age-old question. Does immolation damage outpace the cleric's healing? And the answer, thankfully, is yes. But only if you're extremely aggressive and are willing to tank every hit thrown your way. If you so much as step away for two seconds, they'll heal and make you start the process all over again. 
But with the clairs removed from the equation, all that's left is the prowling Magus himself. And with no one left to act as a meat shield and no way to heal himself, he finally goes down. I don't want to play anymore. But with that finally done, it's time to move on to our next potential roadblock, the Duke's dear Freya. This ought to be interesting. Not only do we have to deal with Freya's little spiders, which don't appear to be too bad, but we also have to remember to, you know, dodge. Come on. What are you doing? Come on! This isn't even the boss anymore. What the f are you do? Finally. God's teeth. All right, now go kill Freya. Kill Freya. Lemon? Lemon, what are you doing? She barely even moves. All you need to do is stand in front of her and... Okay, so, a few things. First off, I'm incredibly surprised that Freya's heads never fell off her body. I'm not sure exactly how that mechanic works, but I guess the damage from immolation was so low that it just never happened. So that potential brick wall has been shattered. And second, I cheated. And I showed you exactly how. For those of you who follow the channel closely, you'll know that I had reached my absolute limit at this point in the run, and was going hollow just trying to get it done. Receipts for reference. Essentially, while the run itself was theoretically doable, the realization that I would need a million souls to open the door of winter just to keep going, since that would have been, incredibly, easier than dealing with the old Iron King's nonsense, broke my spirit and made me want to put the run down. But, to my relative surprise, you all decided that a failed run was better than no run at all. And so, I decided to cheat. And I apologize for that. Now, technically speaking, this run is doable. If you have the time and dedication to join the Company of Champions and grind out minions, or use Bonfire Aesthetics on any easy boss over and over again, you can eventually reach 99 in all of your stats. You don't need to, of course. None of your stats are actually required to be any higher than they already were before I gave myself 99s across the board. There are a lot of consumables in this game that make it completely possible, and we'll talk about those in a bit. But, in the interest of saving time and getting this video out in less than five years, I decided to allow the technicality and just speed up the process, giving myself the required souls to level up and open the winter door. And as you can see, it, uh, it really didn't help all that much. The damage for immolation never changes, no matter what your stats are. So the only real benefit I gained was a larger health pool and more equip weight. And with these new boosts in play, I was able to finally knock out the bell gargoyles with only 9 casts of immolation, proving yet again that my artificial increase was entirely unnecessary. All it really did was give me some extra wiggle room and a slight boost to my sanity. So, if we're all willing to pretend that I did in fact grind out 1 million souls, we can continue this godforsaken run and see how the rest plays out. Because if there's one thing I've learned from this run, it's that no one should ever have to do this run. And hopefully, with this video, no one ever will. So, with that all out of the way, let's see how the rest of this run plays out. Starting with the Dragon Rider duo. Their health bars aren't exceptionally beefy, so as long as you mind your step, recast immolation when needed, and avoid getting slapped by the Dragon Rider shield break, you should be fine. Dragon Rider number 2 joins the fight after you get the first rider down to about half health, so no worries there. He also has less health than the main rider, so if you're having trouble dealing with the two of them, maybe focus your fire on him and make your job a bit easier. After that, it's a simple task of circling around and waiting it out. Five casts. Moving on. Now, if you've unlocked all the shortcuts and hidden bonfires in Drang Lake Castle, we now have access to a very important grinding spot, the Desert Sorcerer's Room. It's close to the bonfire, and with these two so easily accessed, we can now grind them for as long as we like in an attempt to get... Uh, that's never happened before. To... Do we reset, or...? Yeah, no, that works too, I guess. They don't take a lot of damage from your fire, so it takes longer than preferred. But when you kill them, they have a chance of dropping some very important items. One of which is the Lingering Dragon Crest Ring plus one, which boosts the length of immolation from 15% to 25%. Definitely important, and also the highest we can get. There is a plus two version that increases the length to 50%, but, uh, yeah. Also worth noting is another drop from the Desert Sorceress, the Wilted Dusk Herb. This little plant replenishes your spell uses, and significantly so. Kinda wish I had realized that there was more options than just putting points into attunement, but such is life. And with these two new additions to our arsenal, our build is almost complete. There's a few more items we need to really maximize how sad this build can get, but we're not quite there yet. So before we look into any of that, it's time for the Looking Glass Knight. How hard can it be? So yeah, remember how enemies that stand in water have fire resistance? Well, the devs of Dark Souls 2 have outdone themselves, because guess who counts as wet due to standing in the rain? Now, normally, this wouldn't bother me. 
With our newfound way of having more than 15 casts of immolation, this fight will be a grind, but a grind with an end. Right? Wrong. Because LGK here is a lonely fellow, and loves to bring his friends to any party he's invited to. Even when they're unwanted! Needless to say, his friends also get a fire resistance boost, and barely feel the effects of immolation at all. Oh, and there's two of them. So that's cool. And if there's one Achilles heel to this entire stupid build, it's being hit from multiple sides. So with that in mind, I think it's time we finish the build. Our suffering is only going to increase from here on out, so we might as well maximize everything else in kind. Yep, should have listened to that one. After multiple very violent games of Red Rover, we grab the Eye of the Princess, which we don't really need just yet, pull a few levers and climb a few ladders around the area, and eventually find my prize, the North Water set. This bad boy has a special ability. It increases your spell durations by 22.5%, which means our flames now burn as long as they possibly can without doing hundreds of hours of PvP, with immolation only. Yeah, no, I'm good. But with my new garbs and equipment in hand, surely that's enough to beat the Looking Glass Knight, right? I mean, I don't know how much more this build can improve. I'm already grasped at straws here. The results are, well, I mean, you've got eyes. But while having longer casts of immolation at a quicker casting rate does reduce some of the stress of finding the right times to reset, it's still not helping with the main problem I'm having, which is being good at the game. I tried focusing on the mobs instead of LGK, but he took offense to that. So it was time for more grinding. But of what you ask? Rats. All kinds of rats. Because as it turns out, they drop old radiant life gems, which, as you can see, heal 1300 health over about 30 seconds. Needless to say, this was another item that wasn't actually necessary to complete the run. And if you should ever decide to do this run for yourself, which you should not, then you could just as easily complete the run with regular life gems that you could buy infinitely from Malentia. But at this point in time, I could feel the hollowing creeping in. And in the interest of proving a point, I succumbed and removed the grind. Dishonor. Dishonor on me. Dishonor on my cow. And you know what's wild? It didn't even help all that much. I still lose health every second, and at a pretty one-to-one -one rate, unless I start stacking gems. Sanity buffers. That's literally all they are. What wasn't a sanity buffer, though, was the Wilted Dusk Herb. I used all 15 immolations and had about 30% of LGK's health to go. So good on me for thinking ahead with that one. And after a grand total of 23 casts, 53 life gems, and 22 minutes and 20 seconds of scurrying around his feet, the Looking Glass Knight finally goes down. And yes, it will get worse from here. I sprint my way through Sniper Alley, hugging a few choice enemies along the way, and eventually made my way to the Demon of Song. There is not a whole lot to say here. She takes 10 damage when she's out of her frog suit, and 1 damage when she's not. She's also in water, so this is going to be another battle of attrition. I love it! It takes all 15 casts of immolation and about 15 minutes of running around, but eventually, Grandma Frogger goes down. What am I doing with my life? So now, with the undead crypt unlocked, we can finally meet Aldia. And, um, hmm, that's, uh, that's never happened before. Oh, God, he doesn't appear unless you've beaten all four Lord Souls. And if he doesn't appear, we won't be able to fight him. Do you realize what this means? Human. Do not produce light. Shut up, Agdane! We're gonna have to fight the old Iron King anyway. I, I don't want to play anymore. Someone, please stop the ride. I want to get off. I want to get off! They'll stop. The Royal Aegis. Upsettingly simple. Hug the man until he buffs himself, then hug the man some more for less damage than before. I feel nothing with this victory. Moving on. Grab the King's Ring, then begin the torment that is revisiting the old Iron King's castle. Brother! Hope you brought enough life gems with you. You're taking double immolation damage on this one. The fight itself is simple enough. Just play like you normally would. Then strap yourself in. It's gonna be a long one. Or I thought it would be, anyway. Surprisingly, it only takes 14 immolations to knock out the Smelter Demon. The life gem tax is heavy though, so don't think it'll be too easy. Yes, hi, hello! Brother! This armor does nothing. I know someone's gonna ask, so let me be clear. It does nothing. Which means there's nothing to do now but go after the old Iron King. This boss sucks. Think of your least favorite thing? This is it. Manifested in video game boss format. Unless one of his fists are within burning distance, you do zero damage. And when they are in burning distance, you get one, maybe two hits in. Maybe 10 hits if he does his laser palm attack, which means you can get a whopping 40 damage in. How much health does he have? Oh right, 6,000! Hope you brought 99 of each life gem with you in a multitude of herbs, because you live here now. I don't want to play anymore! But we must have done something right, because look who it is! Yes, God please!
Well, you heard the massive pile of flaming scraps. Got a long way to go. Oh, hi, Mark. Time for the Guardian Dragon. This should be fun. The damage is awful, as per usual, and the dragon tends to hop around the arena, flying away pretty much every 10 seconds or so. It's a battle of attrition, and not a very interesting one. Just do your thing whenever he lands, and feel free to take advantage of the fact that sometimes his tail hangs a little low while he's flying around. Right, moving on. Just kidding, we get to do it three more times! After we play a little ring around the rosy with these boys, anyway. The good news is that these dragons don't fly, so it's much less of a hassle. The bad news is they still have boatloads of health. So, you know, strap in. Alright, finally. Now we can... Oh, I'm faltering, I can assure you. Oh, uh, whatever. It's time to make our way through the Dragon Bros. And you know what? This is actually one of the few times I won't just sprint my way past. This build is absolutely awful at getting past enemies, since you can't actually push them back. So, for our sake, it's probably better if we just kill the Guardians and earn the respect of the Dragon Bros instead. That way only about three or four people actually mess with me. And with all the Dragon Rider Guardians removed, including their champion, who was a real pain in the ass with his high fire resistance and constant shield breaking, we are, officially, granted an audience with the Ancient Dragon. Finally. Now we can move on. What's that? You wanted to see what the fight with the Ancient Dragon looks like? Here you go! It's just this. Forever. Hope you like the sound of squishing flesh! I do that thing where we hug a few trees and collect all the giant souls or whatever. Then make my way over to the Giant Lord. Finally, we're caught up to Yanfa. How far are we into this video? 30 minutes? Well, we already knew this fight was going to be dull. Nothing to see here. I guess I can brag that I almost beat the Giant Lord before the Ashen Mist warning text appeared, so that's cool, I guess. Anyway, with the Giant Lord defeated and a little rolling and faffing about with the last remaining giants, I finally get the last giant soul and the key I need to unlock the first DLC. You all excited? I know I am! But first, let's make sure there's no unfinished business on this side. Vendrick is still standing, so we need to go take care of him. He's always a battle of attrition no matter what build you're using, and very, very boring. He takes over 15 minutes to kill, and a restock of immolations just to get him burnt down. But down he does in fact burn. You know what? One last upgrade to the build before we go. We've got the strength for it, we might as well use it. There we are, Havel's Great Shield. The strongest shield in the game as far as defenses and stability goes. I guess we could have grabbed this one ages ago as well, but again, such is life. One more boss to go before we can go to the DLC. And you're not gonna like how we get to them. Yep, we gotta clear every single portal. All of which have a bunch of enemies in them. All of which are pretty damn beefy. Oh, and don't worry, they know exactly how to deal with our build. Havel's shield can only do so much against its brother! Oh, and if that wasn't fun enough for you, they've got Estus Flats too! Several of them! And God help you if more than one NPC notices you at a time! <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but at the end of it all, we can finally face them. The Dark Lurkers. Honestly, kinda bad. If it weren't for them splitting in two and giving me more enemies to fight, this would have been a one and done kind of boss fight. But as it stands, with both of them blasting you with some pretty heavy magic attacks, you have to be careful about which way you're facing. Otherwise, it's back to the beginning with you! Yep, All the NPCs! All over again! Again! Over again! over and over and over and when you're finally done what does it mean what does it mean young undead you've discovered the truest dark within you <laughs> we need the abyss more now than ever too true too true uh, uh, god it hurts it hurts gotta Gotta keep going. Not much more to go now. Nothing we haven't seen before. Nothing we haven't faced. And when we fall, just just get back up. And keep getting back up. Keep fighting until you're the last one standing. Everything else will break down. Nothing of value will remain. Until there is nothing but you in the abyss, and your fingernails desperately clinging to whatever minuscule handholds they can find. But you will persist. By God will you persist. And against all odds, you'll win. And then, when your will is weakened and your strength deplenished, you'll fight again. And again. Against greater and greater odds will you struggle. Into greater and greater despair will you fall. But if you falter, who then will take your place? Will anyone? Or will the questions that plague your addled mind go unanswered? Riddles shouted into the dark, with 
No reply but the stillness of the air and the loudness of your own breath. No answers. None at all. So it's up to us. Like a prophet receiving visions from an angry god, you will take up the task. You will answer the call. And you will win. You will laugh in the face of despair. You will break through the waves of despondence. And you will know no peace until it is done. Over and over again, you'll throw yourself into the grinder. Over and over again, you'll push forward one length just to fall back three. But you can't stop. Why would you stop? Why did you start? Do you even remember? Was it all worth it? Was all of this, whatever this is, worth it? Surely, after so many hours, after so much pain, you know the answer. After all, what does it mean if you've come this far without really knowing why? In the end, all you can do is proceed. After all, it is the only choice left to you. If there was ever a choice at all. So rise. Rise up, conqueror of adversity. Seeker of fire. Coveter of the throne. It grows deeper still, the more flame you covet. And like a desperate man grasping at embers, your very efforts to get closer to the warmth, closer to the light, will burn you. I, I don't know anymore. I simply don't know. Normally with these challenges, I can see the end. See victory. See progress. Not here. Not this time. Even writing my thoughts on this whole debacle was difficult. I literally found myself staring at my screen. At a lack of words. This... This has never happened to me before. The utter futility of it all. How do you, how do you capture that in words? Hell, I couldn't even escape my burdens with a montage. What, a montage of a cloaked woman walking slowly around bosses until they died? No, in the end, there was no choice but to do exactly what I did in the challenge run. I simply had to push forward, head bowed and back broken from the strain. Make no mistake, this run broke me. I'm sure that was clear before now, but I wanted written in ink. There are no words that can describe the mental pain I suffered with this run. I've faced the abyss before, but this, nothing like this. I guess I wasn't expecting Oblivion to be so utterly and uncategorically mundane. How's the old saying go? The world will end not with a bang, but with a whimper. Hmm. I suppose there are words to describe this run after all. A run that demands nothing but the entirety of your patience and the complete subjugation of your mind. A run that will take everything from you without fail. And, simultaneously, will mean nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. So please, grant me just this one thing, for it is all that I ask. Heed my warning. Ignore the temptations. Do not succumb to the lure of the challenge that is immolation. There is no light here. No true victory to be found. A little light at the end, if ever there was light, is fleeting. And now, only darkness remains.